Race and ethnicity have defined every nation on Earth, except one, the United States of America. It is defined by values. So to understand America, you have to understand American values. They are 1. E pluribus unum, 2. Liberty, 3. In God We Trust. I call this the American Trinity. I made up the name, but I didn't make up the values. They are on every American coin. The first, E pluribus unum, is Latin, meaning out of many, one. When first adopted as an American motto, shortly after the American founding in 1776, it referred to the 13 American colonies becoming one nation. Over time, however, most Americans understood the motto to mean one people from many backgrounds. To quote the E Pluribus Unum Project, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, over the years, E Pluribus Unum has also served as a reminder of America's bold attempt to make one unified nation of people from many different backgrounds and beliefs. In other words, America doesn't care about your national or ethnic origins. This explains why people who immigrate to America assimilate faster and more fully than immigrants to any other country. Most of those who have immigrated to Europe from, for example, Turkey, as millions have, are not considered fully German by fellow Germans or fully Swedish by fellow Swedes or fully Spanish by fellow Spaniards. This is even true of the children and grandchildren of those immigrants. And just as important, few of those immigrants or their children or grandchildren will ever feel fully German, Swedish, or Spanish. But a Turk who immigrates to the United States will be regarded as fully American, as American as any other American, the moment he or she becomes a citizen. And they, and certainly their children, will feel fully American. Of course, America has not always lived up to this e pluribus unum ideal, but the ideal was always there, and it was applied to virtually every immigrant to America. The second component of the American Trinity is liberty. Now you might ask, didn't the French Revolution also enshrine liberty as a central national value? Wasn't its motto liberty, equality, fraternity? The answer is yes. America is hardly the only country to enshrine liberty. It is the only country to enshrine liberty, e pluribus unum, and in God we trust. What's the difference? The difference is this. The moment you affirm equality, as the French Revolution did, you will lose liberty. It is a basic American value that all human beings are born equal and all must be equal before the law. But ending up equal, that's a French and European value. And if you want people to end up equal, you must deprive them of liberty which is exactly what happened right after the French Revolution and in every other society that made equality its national goal. America gives people the liberty to end up wherever their abilities, work ethic, and luck take them, meaning unequal. Therefore, professional athletes will make more money than teachers or doctors. That may be unfortunate, but that is what liberty allows. If you want equality, you will tell people how much they can earn and that means the end of liberty. And third, in God we trust. Unlike almost every other country, America never had a state religion. But it was founded on the principle that God, specifically the God of the Bible, is the source of moral values. As the Declaration of Independence put it, all people are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, Rights come from God, not from men. If rights are given by men, men can take them away. The American Trinity is the reason America became the world's freest and most prosperous country. But many Americans want to, in the words of former President Barack Obama, fundamentally transform it. They wish to replace American values with European values. Equality of result and an ever-expanding state which greatly reduce individual freedom, the celebration of ethnic and racial identity, which is the opposite of e pluribus unum, and the removal of God as the source of morality and rights. Which set of values Americans adopt will determine whether America remains free, prosperous, 
and the force for good in the world that it has been. With the exception of the Civil War, this is the greatest internal battle in American history. I'm Dennis Prager. I want to talk to you about the Electoral College and why it matters. All right, I know this doesn't sound like the most sensational topic of the day, but stay with me because I promise you it's one of the most important. To explain why requires a very brief civics review. The President and Vice President of the United States are not chosen by a nationwide popular vote of the American people. Rather, they are chosen by 538 electors. This process is spelled out in the United States Constitution. Why didn't the founders just make it easy and let the presidential candidate with the most votes claim victory? Why did they create, and why do we continue to need this electoral college? The answer is critical to understanding not only the electoral college, but also America. The founders had no intention of creating a pure majority rule democracy they knew from careful study of history what most have forgotten today or never learned. Pure democracies do not work. They implode. Democracy has been colorfully described as two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for dinner. In a pure democracy, bare majorities can easily tyrannize the rest of a country. The founders wanted to avoid this at all costs. This is why we have three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. It's why each state has two senators, no matter what its population, but also different numbers of representatives based entirely on population. It's why it takes a supermajority in Congress and three quarters of the states to change the Constitution. And it's why we have the Electoral College. Here's how the Electoral College works. The presidential election happens in two phases. The first phase is purely democratic. We hold 51 popular elections every presidential election year, one in each state and one in D.C. On election day in 2012, you may have thought you were voting for Barack Obama or Mitt Romney, but you were really voting for a slate of presidential electors. In Rhode Island, for example, if you voted for Barack Obama, you voted for the state's four Democratic electors. If you voted for Mitt Romney, you were really voting for the state's four Republican electors. Part two of the election is held in December, and it is this December election among the state's 538 electors, not the November election, which officially determines the identity of the next president. At least 270 votes are needed to win. Why is this so important? Because the system encourages coalition building and national campaigning. In order to win, a candidate must have the support of many different types of voters from various parts of the country. Winning only the South or the Midwest is not good enough. You cannot win 270 electoral votes if only one part of the country is supporting you. But if winning were only about getting the most votes, a candidate might concentrate all of his efforts in the biggest cities or the biggest states. Why would that candidate care about what people in West Virginia or Iowa or Montana think? But, you might ask, isn't the election really only about the so-called swing states? Actually, no. If nothing else, safe and swing states are constantly changing. California voted safely Republican as recently as 1988. Texas used to vote Democrat. Neither New Hampshire nor Virginia used to be swing states. Most people think that George W. Bush won the 2000 election because of Florida. Well, sort of, but he really won the election because he managed to flip one state which the Democrats thought was safe, West Virginia. Its four electoral votes turned out to be decisive. No political party can ignore any state for too long without suffering the consequences. Every state, and therefore every voter in every state, is important. The Electoral College also makes it harder to steal elections. Votes must be stolen in the right state in order to change the outcome of the Electoral College. With so many swing states, this is hard to predict and hard to do. But without the Electoral College, any vote stolen in any precinct in the country could affect the national outcome, even if that vote was easily stolen in the bluest California precinct or the reddest Texas one. The Electoral College is an ingenious method of selecting a president for a great, diverse republic such as our own. 
It protects against the tyranny of the majority, encourages coalition building, and discourages voter fraud. Our founders were proud of it. We can be too. I'm Tara Ross for Prager University. Well, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for, but I am here to tell you who not to vote for. Don't vote for anyone who says, I'll fight for you, because that person is full of crap and has no intention of not only fighting for you, he doesn't know who you are. He or she's just moving on to the next town where they can point at the next sap and say, I'll fight for you. So tired of these politicians in their town hall meetings when somebody stands up and says, I'm pregnant with quadruplets. Um, I've been put on academic probation at the junior college and my milkman hates my guts. What are you gonna do for me? And my answer is nothing, but here's the good news. We live in the United States. You can do something for you. Feel free to get a job and fight to keep it. Let me give you a really good example of people doing too much for others and us coming apart at the seams as a society. You guys remember when you were kids and you'd fake an illness and you'd stay home from school and you'd sit there on your sofa and you'd watch daytime TV. Hey, I'm Wally Thorpe, school of trucking. You can get to trucking too, be a long haul trucker, get your license, hit the open road, make a good living. Learn typewriter repair. Learn toaster repair. Remember all of those commercials? Every single commercial was geared to somebody who was out of work, but who wanted to work. Why? Well, it's Tuesday. It's noon. Who's going to be home watching this TV show? People who are out of work. What do people who are out of work want to do? They want to get to work. Thus, they learn to drive an 18-wheeler. Now, look at every commercial that's on during daytime TV wrongfully let go by an employer, slip and fall in a supermarket, you can sue. Hi, I'm attorney Lance Bassman, and I'll fight for you. See, the same people that say they're gonna fight for you are the same people trying to get you free crap when you won't get off your ever enlarging butt that's now melding and becoming one with your sofa. Fixing your screwed up life is not the government's job. And by the way, when does the government do a good job at fixing anything? I mean, I live in Los Angeles. We pay the most in taxes and we get the least in education. I want the government to do stuff that I can't do. Stop a war, end a plague, that kind of stuff. Stuff involving me, stuff involving my family, stuff involving my community. I can handle that. Also, don't vote for the politician who says, I know it's not a level playing field, I'm gonna level it for you. That's impossible. It is mathematically impossible to have a level playing field. What are we gonna do about fat people being discriminated against? Some people are born with one limb shorter than the other. Other people are born with a Brillo head. There's nothing we can do about it. The government's job is to clear the playing field not level the playing field, since it's impossible for them to level the playing field, just clear it of all the landmines and all the barbed wire and let us get to work. And don't worry, this is a great country. The harder you work, the more you score, and eventually your team goes to the Super Bowl. So let's review. I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for, I'll tell you who not to vote for. Don't vote for the guy who says he's gonna get rid of all your problems, take care of you, and tuck your kids in at night. You see, humans need challenges to overcome, just like a muscle needs resistance to grow. In a zero gravity environment, an astronaut's muscles atrophy because there is no resistance. The government giving you a bunch of handouts and living your life for you is basically the equivalent of doing push-ups in outer space. Look, Ma, I can clap five times, just like Rocky in between sets. Big government is like the void of space. It's massive, constantly expanding, and if we immerse ourselves in it, we'll simply wither away. I'm Adam Carolla for Prager University. What is religious freedom? Why is it important? And why is it now under threat? 
Hold on a second, I can hear you saying. Religious freedom is threatened? Who doesn't have religious freedom in the United States? You can be a Protestant, a Catholic, a Jew, a Muslim, or a Wiccan. You can believe in anything or nothing. This was true, but not anymore. Seems like almost every week a new dispute arises between people of faith and government agencies alleging that believers are violating the rights of non-believers or simply violating government edicts. Given that the search for religious freedom was central to the founding of America, this is quite a reversal. As Thomas Paine put it in his influential 1776 pamphlet, Common Sense, this new world hath been the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. It wasn't an accident that the first freedom listed in the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, is about religious liberty. Here's what it says. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This meant the new United States would have no government-sponsored religion as Europe had at the time and no restrictions on how you practiced your religion. British historian Paul Johnson draws a stark and telling contrast between the two great revolutions of the 18th century. The essential difference between the American Revolution and the French Revolution is that the American Revolution, in its origins, was a religious event, whereas the French Revolution was an anti-religious event. That fact was to shape the American Revolution and determine the nature of the independent state it brought into being. Now, two centuries after the Bill of Rights, freedom of religion, one of the main goals of the American Revolution, has morphed into freedom from religion, one of the main goals of the French Revolution. That's not what any American should wish for. Here's why. Because when they come for your religious freedom, they're coming for all of your freedom. It's the totalitarian tell, the giveaway. This is what the founders understood and why they were so insistent that religious liberty be in the Constitution. To them, freedom of liberty was tantamount to freedom of thought. If you aren't free to think as you wish, you can't claim to be free. They were right. There is no example in history of a regime suppressing religious freedom and not suppressing other freedoms. One of the first things the communists did in Russia after the Russian Revolution in 1917 was to close nearly every church and take control of all religious life in the Soviet Union, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim. To this day, all religious life in China is strictly controlled by the Chinese Communist government. Why do repressive governments fear religious freedom? because it challenges the authority of the state more than any other freedom. People who adhere to a religion believe that there's something higher than the state, and no repressive government can tolerate such a belief. That makes religion the first target of those who want ever more power and ever more control over its citizens. That's why, even if you're not religious, if you care about freedom, you should care deeply about religious liberty. My job is to protect religious liberty, and let me tell you, the trends are troubling. Eight years ago, my caseload was 47. Last year, it was over 300. Here are some recent examples. Bremerton, Washington high school football coach Joe Kennedy was first suspended and then fired for going to a knee after a football game to say a brief, silent prayer. A three-judge panel for the Ninth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals concluded that because Coach Kennedy could be seen, engaging in religious expression by students and fans, the school had the right to fire him. The city of Houston is attempting to ban a small Orthodox Jewish community from worshiping in the home of its rabbi. Given that the neighborhood includes a rehab house, a Ghanaian church, and an East Indian cultural center, the city's action is hard to fathom. A peace cross in Bladensburg, Maryland has stood for almost 100 years in honor of 49 young men who died fighting in World War I. Yet in 2017, a court ordered the cross to be torn down. One judge offered a novel compromise. She suggested we chop the arms off the cross to make it less offensive. Fortunately, we won that case 7-2 at the United States Supreme Court, and that cross is still standing. America is also still standing, but it won't be for much longer not as the free country the founders envisioned, if we don't take these threats to religious freedom seriously. The great historian of post-revolutionary America, Alexei de Tocqueville, understood this very well. When men attack religious beliefs, 
They are following their emotions, not their interest. Tyranny may be able to do without faith, but freedom cannot. I'm Kelly Shackelford, President of First Liberty for Prager University. Almost everyone has heard of the doctrine of the separation of church and state. Most Americans believe that it's in the United States Constitution. But there is no such phrase in the Constitution, and there never was, for a simple reason. The Founding Fathers never intended for church and state to be completely separate. They saw religion, specifically religions based on the Bible, as indispensable to the moral foundation of the nation they were creating. So where does that phrase come from? It comes from one brief letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association in 1802. At the end of a very long sentence in which Jefferson affirms his conviction that religious belief should be a private matter and that the government should not interfere with such matters, he uses the phrase, building a wall of separation between church and state. And that's where the phrase lived, undisturbed, lost in Jefferson's voluminous correspondence for almost 150 years. But more on that in a moment. First, let's discuss what the Constitution actually does say about religion and its role in public life. The answer is found in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It's plain what those words mean. The federal government could not establish a national religion, the common practice in Europe. The United States was going to be different. Americans would be free to follow the religion of their choice. When James Madison first proposed what eventually became the First Amendment, his original wording was that no religion shall be established by Congress. But that language was later modified after it was pointed out that this might be taken to mean that the government including the state governments, had no interest in religion at all. The founders did not want this. As George Washington said in his farewell address, religion and morality are indispensable supports of our political prosperity. Washington's view remained the nation's view throughout the 19th century and into the 20th, but that changed in 1947. In that year, in the case of Everson versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court ruled in a five to four decision that under the First Amendment, neither a state nor the federal government could pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another. For the first time in American history, the First Amendment was not only about the prohibition of establishing a national religion, it was also about not giving any encouragement to any religion. The modern strict separation view was born. And where did the five justices look for support for their argument? Not the Constitution, because there was nothing in the Constitution to help them, but to that one phrase Thomas Jefferson wrote back in 1802. How ironic that the author of the Declaration of Independence, which recognizes the proposition that human beings have inalienable rights from their creator and not from government, was now being used to separate religion from the public square. For Jefferson and the other founders, religion was central to the entire American project. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are just two of countless examples where the government acknowledges its debt to God. As the famously liberal Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas wrote in the case of Zorak versus Clausen just five years after the Everson decision, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. The founders would certainly have agreed. Following Everson, the nation's moral infrastructure began to crack, at first slowly and then more rapidly. In 1962, the Supreme Court struck another blow. It ruled in Engel versus Vitale that a generic school prayer violated the court's new definition of the First Amendment. Listen to the words of that school prayer. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. The prayer was not specific to Christianity or to any religion. Since then, 
The separation of church and state metaphor has been used to remove God and religion piece by piece from American public life. Are we a better society for it? It's hard to argue that we are. Almost every cultural and ethical indicator, marriage rates, birth rates, the number of Americans giving to charity, has declined since God and religion have faded from American life. Meanwhile, children without fathers in their lives, behavioral problems in schools, and crime have gone up dramatically, and all because of one vote in one court case based on one sentence in one letter. On such things do nations and history turn. I'm John Eastman, professor of law at Chapman University and a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute for Prager University. This video was made possible through a generous donation by the Boyd family. There are a lot of partisan political issues out there, but election integrity shouldn't be one of them. What could be more basic to the very concept of representative government than having citizens trust that an election, whether it be for president or dog catcher, was fairly won or fairly lost? Yet in the recent past, this issue has become very contentious. For purposes of our discussion here, let's put aside any feelings we might have regarding a specific election. Here's the conflict. One side is primarily concerned that all votes are legitimately cast. That is, each vote can be traced to the person voting. The other side is primarily concerned that as many people as possible have the opportunity to vote. Now, a very obvious question arises. Why are these two concerns incompatible? Well, the answer is they are not. We should be able to both verify voters and make it easy to vote at the same time. Yes, even in politics, it should be possible to walk and chew gum simultaneously. Let's look to see how Georgia, where there has been much controversy over voting, has addressed this issue. First concern, voter ID. The recent Georgia voter reform law requires voters to provide an ID to receive an absentee ballot. Since 2008, the state has required a voter to show a government-issued photo ID when he or she votes in person. To require the same level of security for absentee voting seems to make perfect sense. In fact, one wonders why this wasn't addressed sooner. There's simply no good evidence that possessing an ID presents a hardship to voting. Have you ever met anyone who didn't have an ID? Anyone? When a federal judge threw out the ACLU-led lawsuit against Georgia's in-person voter ID law, he noted that in two years of litigation, the challengers could not produce a single resident of the state unable to vote because of the new ID requirement. But wait, as they say in TV ads, there's more. The new law says you can satisfy the voter ID requirement with a copy of a current utility bill, bank statement, government check, paycheck, or other government document that shows the name and address of the would-be voter. It's worth noting that the language on voter IDs for absentee ballots is identical to the language in the federal Help America Vote Act of 2002, which passed the U.S. Senate by a vote of 92 to 2. The yes votes included then-Senator Joe Biden of Delaware. Let's move on to the second concern, making voting easy. The charge against Georgia's new voting law is that it prohibits voters from access to water while they wait in line. One has to admit that sounds harsh. But if we dig a little deeper, we find that like most other states, Georgia prohibits electioneering within 150 feet of a polling place or within 25 feet of any voters waiting in line to vote. The new law simply added that within such distances, no one can give, offer to give, or participate in the giving of any money or gift, including, but not limited to, food and drink to any elector. In other words, a candidate, his supporters, or an activist group can't show up at a polling place with a truckload of Happy Meals and start handing them out to voters standing in line. The clear intent here is to prevent operatives from any party from unduly influencing voters with money or gifts, including food and drink. The idea that Georgia is somehow doing something nefarious by preventing gift giving at the polls is, to put it mildly, bizarre especially considering that this is a standard practice as it should be in most other states, including New York and New Jersey. By the way, 
The law says it's okay for poll officials to make self-service water from an unattended receptacle available to an elector waiting in line. And of course, you can bring a bottle of water with you if you're worried that you're going to die of thirst waiting to vote. But wait, there's more. The state added additional weekend voting days for those who want to vote early. To call these reforms the new Jim Crow, as some have done, or an example of voter suppression is simply not true. In fact, it's so far from the truth, it makes one wonder about the accuser's motives. But more than anything, it is an insult to the people who really did suffer under restrictive voting laws of the past. But those days are long gone, and the numbers prove it. Georgia has seen record levels of voter registration and turnout in recent elections, including 2020. That includes Blacks and Hispanics, and that's been the trend for a decade. Anybody who wants to vote can vote. Introducing a few safeguards to build confidence that only legal votes are cast and counted just seems to make common sense. So why all the controversy? I'm Hans von Spakovsky, Senior Legal Fellow at the Heritage Foundation for Prager University. Do Republicans win elections by preventing minorities, Blacks, Latinos, and others, from voting? For those on the left and their allies in the major media, the answer is yes. Even more than that, it's an article of faith. The usual example they offer is state laws, often passed by Republican-majority legislatures, requiring voters to present a photo ID at their polling place, something required in almost every other democracy in the world. According to the left, Voter ID depresses minority turnout and is therefore a blatant form of racial discrimination. But there's a problem with this accusation. There's no evidence to support it. Minorities are voting in greater numbers and at higher percentages than ever before. The facts and figures are there for anyone to see. Still, progressives and most of the political press don't seem to have noticed. Or maybe they just don't want to look. At a 2019 NAACP dinner in Detroit, California Senator Kamala Harris told the audience that voter suppression in Georgia and Florida cost Democrats gubernatorial races in the 2018 midterm elections. Let's say this loud and clear, said Ms. Harris. Without voter suppression, Stacey Abrams would be the governor of Georgia. Andrew Gillum is the governor of Florida. A few days earlier, Ms. Abrams herself, apparently still bitter over her defeat, made a similar claim. We had an architect of voter suppression that spent the last eight years knitting together a system of voter suppression that is unparalleled in America, said Ms. Abrams, in reference to her Republican opponent, a former Georgia Secretary of State. But if minorities are harmed by mandating voter ID and other anti-fraud measures, such as removing inactive voters from registration rolls, why does the evidence all point to the opposite conclusion? A recent Census Bureau report found that voter turnout in 2018 climbed 11 percentage points from the last midterm election in 2014, surpassing 50% for the first time since 1982. Moreover, the increased turnout was largely driven by the same minority voters Democrats claim are being disenfranchised. Black turnout grew around 27%, and Hispanic turnout increased about 50%. None of this comes as news to anyone who pays attention to sober facts instead of inflammatory rhetoric. The black voter turnout rate, for the most part, has grown steadily since the 1990s. This has occurred notwithstanding an increase in state voter ID requirements over the same period. In 2012, blacks voted at higher rates than whites nationwide, including in Georgia, which was one of the first states in the country to implement a photo ID requirement for voting. Ms. Abrams claims that Republicans have been hard at work trying to disenfranchise black voters. But the reality is that black voter registration is outpacing white registration in the Peach State. These gains are not limited to blacks. Voting has been up substantially in all minority groups. An analysis of the census data published by Pew Research Center found that all major racial and ethnic groups saw historic jumps in voter turnout in 2018. Political scientist Teku Lee confirmed this in an op-ed for the New York Times, in which she highlights impressive voting rates for minority women. The 2018 election set new benchmarks for turnout in a midterm election, with a whopping 30 million more people voting than in 2014. For women of color, the increased turnout was even more stark 
at 37%. As to the issue of ensuring the accuracy and integrity of U.S. elections, minority voters appear to be as concerned as everyone else. Ms. Harris and Ms. Abrams may feel that requiring an ID for banking, flying, or buying cold medicine should not apply to voting, but most people don't seem to have that problem. In a 2016 Gallup poll, voter ID laws were supported by four and five respondents, including 95% of Republicans, 63% of Democrats, 81% of whites, and 77% of non-whites. So, if there is no serious opposition to voter ID laws, and no evidence of voter suppression, if, in fact, more people of different races and ethnicities are voting at higher rates than ever before, why won't this voter suppression myth die? The answer is at once surprising and obvious. One party simply can't accept that they will lose a close election. If a Republican wins one of those, there has to be a nefarious reason. Voter suppression is as good as any, even if it has no basis in fact. Ms. Abrams lost, by the way, by over 50,000 votes. Elections are decided by the state of the economy, foreign policy issues, candidate personalities, and a host of other factors. The non-existent problem of voter suppression is not one of them. I'm Jason Riley, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. Here's something we can all agree on. Liberty is a wonderful thing. The American Constitution says so, right in the preamble. The framers established the Constitution to secure the blessings of liberty. So why doesn't that offer a clear answer to most of the constitutional questions that face America today? Aren't lawmakers who swear to uphold the Constitution obliged by their oaths to vote for liberty? The problem is that liberty, like equality or justice, is a complicated idea that means different things to different people. Consider, for instance, one simple question. Whom do we want liberty from? Well, we want liberty from a tyrannical government. That's why we have a Bill of Rights. And that's why the Constitution was designed to impose powerful constraints on the federal government and eventually state governments. But we also want liberty from foreign tyrants, right? What's the point of having a government that won't oppress us if it can't protect us from foreign invaders who would oppress us even more? That's why the preamble also says the Constitution is set up to provide for the common defense. Yet to protect ourselves against foreign tyranny, we may need to restrict domestic liberty. At the very least, the government has to impose taxes to pay for the military. Throughout American history, the government has also been seen as having the power to draft men to fight in wars. That's certainly a restriction on individual liberty, but it's long been seen as consistent with the Constitution. We can see other examples, too. The Fourth Amendment bans unreasonable searches and seizures. That's a powerful protection for liberty. But it doesn't ban all searches and seizures. Reasonable ones are allowed. That's in part so the law can better protect us from criminals intruding on our liberty. Likewise, the Fifth Amendment provides that private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. But that means that sometimes your property can be taken for public use with compensation, however much this limits your liberty to, say, continue living in your family house that has been condemned to make room for a highway. Sometimes liberty does yield to public benefit. What's more, everyone agrees that my liberty doesn't extend to violating your rights. But where do my rights stop and yours start? The Constitution itself doesn't tell us, since it lists pretty much just those rights that are protected against government intrusion, like the free exercise of religion. People disagree about what rights should be protected from supposed intrusion by others, for instance, by employers or by large businesses that might try to stifle competition. So what do we do about this? How do we resolve all these hard questions about liberty? First, the framers of the Constitution explicitly protected certain liberties, such as the freedom of speech and the right to keep and bear arms. Second, the framers gave the courts a major role in defining the scope of those liberties. Third, the framers set up the structures of government, such as separation of powers, that would help protect liberty by making sure that no single branch of government could unduly restrict liberty. But then, fourth, they left the rest of the debate about liberty to the political process. Indeed, even the gravest violation of basic natural liberty in American history, slavery, 
was ultimately abolished by the political process, as well as, of course, by the Civil War, which was started and conducted by elected officials. The framers also believed that most decisions in people's lives would not and should not be made by the government. They should be made by ordinary people. Which job to take? Which business to start? Whom to associate with? How much to sell or buy things for? And innumerable other choices. The American experience has been that we are on balance, richer, safer, and freer when those decisions are made outside the government by individuals pursuing their own dreams and their own self-interest. But when it came to most tough questions about what restrictions on liberty are necessary, outside those walled off by the Constitution, the framers left those questions to be decided by the democratic process. It's my view that the government should generally impose as few restrictions as possible, whether on people's personal lives or their economic lives. Others disagree. Should we have smaller government? Should we have bigger government? Ultimately, in the system the framers created, these disagreements would have to be resolved by we the people. To implement your vision of liberty, you have to win elections. And that's exactly what the framers intended. I'm Eugene Volokh, Professor of Constitutional Law at UCLA for Prager University. While the major media fixates on the influence of foreign powers on American elections, a much more serious attack has been taking place right under our noses. Good old-fashioned, homegrown voter fraud. Let's look at three of the worst offenses. Example number one, bloated voter rolls. In 244 counties across the United States, there are more registered voters than there are people legally eligible to vote. 29 states have counties with more registered voters than legal residents, and eight states have more registered voters than actual voting age people. When the Supreme Court upheld Ohio's efforts to clean up its own voter rolls in 2018, the majority opinion cited Pew Center statistics. 24 million voter registrations in the United States are either invalid or significantly inaccurate. And nearly 3 million people are believed to be registered to vote in more than one state. These numbers have a shocking implication. It's very easy to exploit our voting system. During an undercover investigation, New York City detectives made 63 attempts to cast illegal ballots based on flawed voter rolls. They were successful 61 times. Similar investigations in other cities and other states produced the same dismal results. But phony voters on the rolls is just one threat to election integrity. Here's example number two, ballot harvesting. In 2016, the state of California, one of the states with more registered voters than citizens, became the first state to legalize the practice of ballot solicitation, that is, the collection and delivery of ballots by third parties. With no trace of irony, this is called ballot harvesting. It works like this. In California, organizations with a clear political agenda are legally permitted to go to a location, say a nursing home or a church, and collect, literally harvest, ballots. The third party then transports these ballots to a polling place or an election office. This raises an obvious question. Once this third party collects the ballots, what's to stop them from changing them or from just throwing out the ones they don't like? A guilty conscience? How do we know ballot harvesters from Democratic organizations aren't destroying Republican ballots? Or Republican harvesters aren't destroying Democratic ballots? We don't. We have no way of knowing. Let's look at one specific example. On election night in 2018, California Central Valley Republican Congressman David Valadeo held a 5,000-vote lead over his challenger, Democrat T.J. Cox. The margin was wide enough that the networks even called the race for Valadeo, the Republican incumbent. But wait, there were late ballots still to be delivered by the third-party vote harvesters. When those votes came in, they broke so overwhelmingly for Cox, in a historically conservative district, no less, that Valadeo's 5,000-vote victory became an 862-vote loss. Maybe that was just a coincidence. Or maybe not. In the first major election after ballot harvesting was allowed in California, Democrats won every single congressional seat in Orange County, which had been a Republican stronghold for decades. A year earlier, no sober person would have thought that possible. Voter corruption example number three, voting by non-citizens. Should you have to be a citizen to vote? Silly question, right? It was once, not anymore. According to a recent poll, more than half of Democrats, 53%, support granting illegal immigrants the right to vote. 
Forget the legal ones. Democratic National Chair Tom Perez, before working for the Obama administration, worked for a group called Casa de Maryland, which has been a longtime advocate for expanding non-citizen voting rights. Yes, it's true that federal law prohibits non-citizens from voting in federal elections, but 11 states, all run by Democrats, currently allow non-citizen voting of some kind. Cities such as Chicago and San Francisco, for example, allow non-citizens to vote in certain citywide elections. Why? Because for progressives, demography is destiny, and many see illegal immigrants as future voters. So there you have it, three different ways to tamper with the vote. Bloated voter rolls, ballot harvesting, voting by non-citizens. These are just three ways in which the left creates a clear advantage for itself on election day. The major media will tell you that corrupt voting practices either don't exist or are so minor they don't matter. But to believe that, you have to believe two things. That voter registration rolls are accurate and secure from fraudulent registrations. And that no one is trying to manipulate the results for political purposes. Those are two very big leaps. Maybe you want to make those leaps because you like the results they produce. But if you care about free and fair elections, no matter which party you belong to, you need to pay attention. Or pretty soon, free and fair elections will be a quaint relic of the past. No foreign government can undermine our democracy, but Americans can, and some do. I'm Eric Eggers, investigative reporter for the Government Accountability Institute for Prager University. This video was made possible through a generous donation from Bob and Ruth Reingold. Is there a problem with universal mail-in balloting? Sounds simple enough. You fill out a ballot, stick it in the mail, somebody counts it on election day. In fact, we already do that with absentee ballots, right? So why would universal mail-in balloting be any different? Well, the biggest difference is that with absentee ballots, the voter specifically asks for a ballot. With universal mail-in balloting, ballots are mailed out in mass. Millions of people who would normally go to the polls vote by mail instead. No national election has ever been conducted this way. And there are very good reasons to be concerned that one ever should. Reason number one, bureaucratic incompetence. I don't think I have to sell you on the idea that when the government bureaucracy takes on a big new project with little preparation, the results aren't pretty. We've seen those results as it relates to mail-in balloting already. Wisconsin was one of the first states to hold a primary in the coronavirus era. It saw an influx in mail-in votes as a result. Predictably, this led to serious snafus. Thousands of requested ballots were not sent. 1,600 ballots were found in a mail processing center the day after the election. 23,000 votes were rejected due to missing signatures or other missing information. And those are the mistakes we know about in just one state and in one primary election, when fewer people than in the general election typically bother to cast a vote. In Pennsylvania, where they delayed the date of their primary to get better prepared for the expected increase in mail-in balloting, they still couldn't handle the volume. Half of Philadelphia's votes were still uncounted a week after the election. In Virginia, more than half a million applications for ballots were mailed with incorrect information. Some of the applications went to the wrong addresses. Some went to dead voters. One even went to a pet. Under the best of circumstances, the bureaucracy struggles with mail-in balloting. Under less than the best of circumstances, that's not a scenario we want to face. Which brings us to reason number two for concern, shoddy security. Here's what the New York Times said about voting by mail in an article in 2012. Keep in mind, they were talking about traditional absentee balloting not a mass mail-in of ballots. There is a bipartisan consensus that voting by mail, whatever its impact, is more easily abused than other forms. No kidding. In May 2020, New Jersey conducted its first ever all-mail election. One month later, two elected officials were among four charged with criminal conduct involving mail-in ballots. One operative confessed to stealing ballots, both completed and uncompleted, out of mailboxes. Other operatives compiled a database of signatures of prospective voters and then used them to fill out ballots on behalf of their preferred candidates. And we only know about it because they got caught. Election fraud only figures to get easier because of a new weapon in the cheater's arsenal, ballot harvesting. This is the term for when a third party, 
usually a campaign worker or activist, goes to people's homes and collects their ballots. With ballot harvesting, you don't even have to put your ballot in the mailbox. Vote harvesters will pick it up for you. The opportunities for mischief, say, pressuring people to vote a certain way, destroying ballots, or filling out ballots for those who didn't bother to vote, are endless. Vote harvesting that targets senior citizens for their ballots even has its own name, granny farming. Reason number three to be concerned, the likelihood of long delays in determining final results. Americans are used to knowing who won and who lost within hours of the polls closing on election day. Of course, some close races take longer to sort out, but the longer it takes, the less legitimate an election seems. That is exactly what happened in the 2000 presidential election, Bush v. Gore. Then, the dispute was focused on a single state, Florida. It was finally settled by the Supreme Court over a month later. If we have a national election that relies heavily on mail-in voting, we're almost certain to see a significant delay before we get the final results. From the post office to the vote counters, the system is just not set up for it. In a close contest involving massive mail-in voting, lawsuits disputing the results are inevitable. This could delay final results even longer. And instead of involving a single state, it's likely to involve multiple states. This is a recipe for civil unrest as frustration and fear of a stolen election grips voters. Bureaucratic incompetence, shoddy security, long delays. These are just some of the concerns any reasonable person should have over universal mail-in balloting. What's the solution? Simple. If you need to vote absentee, request a ballot. Otherwise, vote like you always have, in person. I'm Eric Eggers, investigative reporter for the Government Accountability Institute for Prager University. This video was made possible through a generous donation from Fritz and Glenda Corrigan. Over the past 50 years, the purpose of the American government has undergone a radical transformation. So much so that even Franklin Roosevelt wouldn't recognize it, let alone Abraham Lincoln or Thomas Jefferson. Once admired for the minor role it played in citizens' lives, the American government, both federal and state, has become within living memory a vast entitlements machine whose primary function is to dispense benefits. Indeed, federal and state governments now devote more attention and resources to the public transfer of money, goods, and services to individual citizens than to anything else. By 2010, entitlement payments accounted for about two-thirds of all federal spending, with all other responsibilities of the federal government, in other words, all the things government should do, making up barely one-third. According to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, in 1960, U.S. government transfers to individuals totaled about $24 billion in current dollars. By 2010, that total was almost 100 times larger, or $2.2 trillion. After adjusting for inflation and population growth, that was still an increase of 727%. What does all this mean? And what is the consequence? From the founding of our nation until quite recently, Americans were regarded, both at home and abroad, as exceptional in a number of ways. One of these was their fierce independence, which informed not only the design of the political experiment that is the U.S. Constitution, but also Americans' approach to everyday affairs. Specifically, this meant an affinity for personal enterprise, a horror of dependency, no and a disdain for anything that smacked of a handout. Overcoming this historic cultural resistance to accepting government aid has not been easy, but it has been achieved. Far from being a source of shame, accepting government aid is now considered normal, even desirable. From cradle to grave, a treasure chest of government-supplied benefits is there for the taking for every American citizen and exercising one's legal rights to these many gifts is now part of the American way of life. In addition to this transformation of fundamental American values, as citizens vote to reward themselves ever more lavishly from government coffers, the obvious question arises, who is going to pay for it? That's a question politicians always seem to prefer to put off till next year. Most probably, the burden will fall on the young. They have decades of tax-paying ahead of them. But having been raised increasingly on the taker mentality 
and accustomed increasingly to accepting government benefits. It's not clear that the young understand the future they face as the cost of these promises far exceed the nation's provision to pay for them. Then again, perhaps they will demand reform and bring us back to an America more committed to personal responsibility and less dependent on government generosity. The U.S. is a very wealthy society. If it so chooses, it has vast resources to squander. And internationally, the dollar remains the world's most trusted currency. Such advantages might postpone the day of economic judgment, but it will not postpone the day of reckoning for the American character. That, unless we decide otherwise, may be sacrificed long before the credibility of the American economy. I'm Nicholas Eberstadt of the American Enterprise Institute for Prager University. G'day there. As an outsider, I have a unique perspective from which to view America. As an American friend said to me, sometimes it takes someone on the outside to remind us what we're like on the inside. I'm an Australian, you might have already guessed that, and I love my home country, and I am proud that my nation has long been a reliable American ally. But I know that Australia is not America, and that my country has not achieved what America has achieved. No country in human history has. What makes America different? There are many answers, but start with one you might not have thought of. Most people think America is all about success. I see it a little differently. I think America is all about failing. Most people in the world don't get the chance to fail, but Americans take it for granted. Only Americans say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. There's even an academic study to prove this. According to a study by Harvard Business School professor Stephen Rogers, most entrepreneurs fail four times before they succeed. Success takes timing and hard work, some good luck, many other factors. But to succeed, you must be given the chance to fail and you must accept responsibility if you do. I love that about Americans. At their best, they don't blame others. They learn from their mistakes and do better the next time. And in America, there's almost always a next time. Nowhere else are you as free to take entrepreneurial risks. Talk to someone who has tried to start a small business in Germany or Brazil, and you'll see what I mean. From the outside looking in, I can only admire this. And I'm not the only one. Just take a look at the CEOs of major Silicon Valley companies. You will see the names of entrepreneurs from all over the world. India, Pakistan, Russia, Israel, you name the country. Why did they come to America to innovate? Because there's a lot of money here? Yes, of course, that's part of it. But there's a lot of money in London and Berlin and Tokyo as well. They came to America because America gave them the chance to fail and therefore the best chance in the world to succeed. And the rest of the world can thank their lucky stars for America's economic success. Not only is America by far the world's largest economy, it is also the world's largest consumer. And the world's economy depends on being able to sell to America. It would also be perfectly natural for Americans to want to keep all this wealth to themselves, but they don't, just the opposite in fact. America has been the most selfless nation in the history of the world. Yet another way in which America is different. What other nation fights for the freedom of others? In Europe, in two world wars, in Korea, in Vietnam, and yes, in Iraq. In all those wars, America had very little or nothing to gain economically. Whenever there is a humanitarian crisis anywhere in the world, Haiti after a hurricane, Indonesia after a tsunami, who is the first to rush aid to these places? No matter where the calamity is, at home or abroad, Americans invariably raise millions of dollars almost instantly to send food and clothing and supplies to people in distress they don't know and will never meet. Who else does that? I love that America is different. What worries me about America is that I see her increasingly trying to act like other nations. It worries me to see that so many Americans are drawn to the ossified ideas of Europe. That's the old world. It was old in 1776 even, when America broke away from it. 
Why would America want to reverse its own revolution? Why would Americans want to follow the economic and social model of a continent that they can see is failing economically and socially? Do Americans really want to emulate France or Greece? It worries me to see so many Americans wallowing in victim status, oh. blaming outside forces for their predicament, rather than accepting responsibility and seeking to improve themselves. It worries me to see American schools debasing America's own glorious history. It worries me to see America's debt and government grow larger while its military and its personal freedoms shrink. It worries me because a weak, self-doubting America is bad for everyone, everywhere, who loves freedom. But these worries never last long, because each time I visit America, I encounter a people who are confident, competitive, courageous, faithful, idealistic, innovative, inspirational, charitable, and optimistic. It's like no other place in the world. I pray it stays that way. I'm Nick Adams for Prager University. Western civilization. It's been around for a while, but suddenly everybody is talking about it. Some are anxious to save it. Others are happy to see it go. But what exactly is Western civilization? Is it the great cathedrals of Europe or the Nazi concentration camps? Is it the freedoms secured in the U.S. Constitution or chattel slavery? Life-saving medicines or poison gas? The left likes to focus on the bad, genocide, slavery, environmental destruction. But those have been present in every civilization from time immemorial. The positives are unique to the West. Religious tolerance, abolition of slavery, universal human rights, the development of the scientific method. These are accomplishments of a scope and scale that only the West can claim. These aren't the only achievements that make the West special and uniquely successful. As Western thought evolved, it secured the rights of women and minorities, lifted billions of people out of poverty, and invented most of the modern world. Progress hasn't been a straight line, of course, but the arc of history is clear. The obvious proof is that the world is overwhelmingly Western. And, with few exceptions, those parts of the world that aren't aspire to be. Why? Why has Western civilization been so successful? There are many reasons, but the best place to start is with the teachings and philosophies that emerged from two ancient cities, Jerusalem and Athens. Jerusalem represents religious revelation as manifested in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the beliefs that a good God created an ordered universe and that this God demands moral behavior from his paramount creation, man. The other city, Athens, represents reason and logic as expressed by the great Greek thinkers, Plato and Aristotle and many others. These two ways of thinking, revelation and reason, live in constant tension. Judeo-Christian religion posits that there are certain fundamental truths handed down to us by a transcendent being. We didn't invent these truths. We received them from God. The rules he lays down for us are vital for building a functioning moral civilization and for leading a happy life. Greek thinking posits that we only know truth by what we observe, test, and measure. It is not faith but fact that drives our understanding and exploration of the universe. Western civilization, and only Western civilization, has found a way to balance both religious belief and human reason. Here's how the balance works. The Judeo-Christian tradition teaches that God created an ordered universe and that we have an obligation to try to make the world better. This offers us purpose and suggests that history moves forward. Most pagan religions taught the opposite, that the universe is illogical and random and that history is cyclical. History just endlessly repeats itself, in which case, why bother to innovate or create anything new? Second, Judeo-Christian tradition teaches that every human is created in the image of God. That is, each individual's life is infinitely valuable. This seems self-evident to us now, but only because we have lived with this belief for so long. The far more natural belief is that the strong should subjugate the weak, which is precisely what people did in nearly every society in all of history. Only by recognizing the divine in others did we ever move beyond this amoral thinking toward the concern for human rights, democracy, and free enterprise that characterized the West. But Judeo-Christian religion alone didn't build our modern civilization. 
we also required Greek reason to teach us objective observation that man has the capacity to search beyond revelation for answers. Greek reason brought us the notion of the natural law, the idea that we could discover the natural purpose, the telos, of everything in creation by looking to its character. Human beings were created with the unique capacity to reason. Therefore, our telos was to reason. By investing reason with so much power, Greek thought became integral to the Western mission. Nowhere is this more perfectly expressed than in the American Revolution, in which the Founding Fathers took the best of the European Enlightenment, with its roots in Greek thought, and the best of Judeo-Christian practice, with its roots in the Bible, and melded them into a whole new political philosophy. Without Judeo-Christian values, we fall into scientific materialism, the belief that physical matter is the only reality, and therefore also fall into nihilism, the belief that life has no meaning, that we are merely stellar dust in a cold universe. Without Greek reason, we fall into fanaticism, the belief that fundamentalist adherence to unprovable principles represents the only path toward meaning. The Soviet Union, Communist China, and other socialist tyrannies rejected faith and murdered 100 million people in the 20th century. Much of the modern Muslim world has embraced faith, but rejected reason. It's noteworthy that when the Muslim world did embrace Greek reason from the 8th to the 14th centuries, it was a leading center for scientific advancement. So again, we need both Jerusalem and Athens, revelation and reason. And yet many want to reject both. These people call themselves progressives. Ironically, they want to take us backwards to a time when man was governed neither by reason nor faith, but by feeling, and therefore back to a time of moral chaos and disorder of feeling over fact. It would be a fatal mistake to follow the progressives. Stick with Athens and Jerusalem. I'm Ben Shapiro, editor of The Daily Wire and author of The Right Side of History for Prager University. In every presidential election, only one question matters. Which candidate will get the 270 votes needed to win the Electoral College? Our founders so deeply feared a tyranny of the majority that they rejected the idea of a direct vote for president. That's why they created the Electoral College. For more than two centuries, it has encouraged coalition building, given a voice to both big and small states, and discouraged voter fraud. Unfortunately, there is now a well-financed, below-the-radar effort to do away with the Electoral College. It is called National Popular Vote, or NPV, and it wants to do exactly what the founders rejected, award the job of president to the person who gets the most votes nationally. Even if you agree with this goal, it's hard to agree with their method. Rather than amend the Constitution, which they have no chance of doing, NPV plans an end run around it. Here's what NPV does. It asks states to sign a contract to give their presidential electors to the winner of the national popular vote instead of the winner of the state's popular vote. What does that mean in practice? It means that if NPV had been in place in 2004, for example, when George W. Bush won the national vote, California's electoral votes would have gone to Bush, even though John Kerry won that state by 1.2 million votes. Can you imagine strongly Democratic California calmly awarding its electors to a Republican? Another problem with NPV's plan is that it robs states of their sovereignty. A key benefit of the Electoral College system is that it decentralizes control over the election. Currently, a presidential election is really 51 separate elections, one in each state and one in DC. These 51 separate processes exist side by side in harmony. They do not and cannot interfere with each other. California's election code applies only to California and determines that state's electors. So a vote cast in Texas can never change the identity of a California elector. NPV would disrupt this careful balance. It would force all voters into one national election pool. Thus, a vote cast in Texas will always affect the outcome in California and the existence of a different election code in Texas always has the potential to unfairly affect a voter in California. Why? Because state election codes can differ drastically. States have different rules about early voting, registering to vote, and qualifying for the ballot. They have different policies regarding felon voting. They have different triggers for recounts. Each and every one of these differences is an opportunity for someone, 
somewhere to file a lawsuit claiming unfair treatment. Why should a voter in New York get more or less time to early vote than a voter in Florida? Why should a hanging Chad count in Florida but not in Ohio? The list of possible complaints is endless. And think of the opportunities for voter fraud if NPV is passed. Currently, an attempt to steal a presidential election requires phony ballots to appear or real ballots to disappear in the right state or combination of states, something that is very hard to anticipate. But with NPV, voter fraud anywhere can change the election results. No need to figure out which states you must swing, just add or subtract the votes you need or don't want wherever you can most easily get away with it. And finally, if NPV is adopted and winning is only about getting the most votes, a candidate might concentrate all of his efforts in the biggest cities or the biggest states. We could see the end of presidential candidates who care about the needs and concerns of people in smaller states or outside of big cities. Here's why all of this is of so much concern. NPV is more than halfway to its goal. NPV's contract will go into effect when states with a combined 270 electoral votes have signed. To date, NPV already has the support of 10 states plus DC. Together, that's 165 electoral votes, leaving only 105 votes to go. It is time to stop this attempt to undo the way American presidents are elected, which will in turn undo America. The people behind NPV think they are wiser than every generation of Americans that preceded them. They aren't. I'm Tara Ross for Prager University. Is America's national anthem racist? Had you asked this question just a few years ago to fans at a baseball, basketball, or football game, they would have assumed you had imbibed one too many beers. Today, thanks to an assault by the progressive left on the Star Spangled Banner and its composer, Francis Scott Key, you might get a different reaction. For example, here's what Jason Johnson, journalism professor at Morgan State University and popular cable news commentator, wrote about the anthem. It is one of the most racist, pro-slavery, anti-black songs in the American lexicon. Is Johnson serious? Actually, he is. And sadly, a lot of progressives agree with him. But why? To answer that question, we need a brief history of the song. Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner after witnessing the American victory at the Battle of Fort McHenry during the War of 1812, a rare bright spot in the young country's second conflict with Britain a conflict in which the Americans mostly got their butts kicked. Critics like Johnson focus on the third stanza, in which Key mocks the retreating British soldiers. Before describing those lyrics, I need to make a point. The third stanza is virtually unknown. Almost no American has ever sung, read, or heard it. But even so, it's not nearly as offensive as it's made out to be. Here's what Key wrote. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. The claim of racism focuses, of course, on Key's use of the word slave, which, so the argument goes, refers to the British Second Corps of Colonial Marines. This unit was composed of former American slaves who had been encouraged to escape bondage and fight alongside British troops. According to this line of thinking, the slave-owning Key, a prominent attorney, was terribly upset by the idea of freed blacks fighting against their former masters and was so gratified by their defeat that he inserted this line into his poem. Like many Americans living in the early 19th century, Key's record on race was mixed. On the one hand, he owned slaves himself. On the other, he offered free legal representation to slaves petitioning the Maryland court for their freedom. In 1835, he served as prosecutor in a case in Washington, D.C. of an enslaved black man, Arthur Bowen, who was accused of threatening his white female owner. But when a riot ensued over the incident, Key bravely stood between Bowen and a lynch mob bent on killing him. With respect to the anthem, there's no direct evidence that Key was referring to the Second Corps of Colonial Marines, that he even knew the unit existed or cared if it did. It should further be noted that this unit was not even present at the battle, so Key could not have seen them fleeing the field. Why then did Key use the word slave? We'll never know for sure, of course, but it's important to note that Key was not the first person to use the expression 
hirelings and slaves. It was a common rhetorical device of the time used on both sides of the Atlantic. You find it in newspaper articles and English language literature well before the onset of the war. It was an all-purpose insult that could be used to refer to enemy troops, foreign leaders, corrupt politicians, or anyone else in need of a put-down. For example, in 1795, long before the Second Corps of Colonial Marines even existed, a dispatch from Baltimore condemned the hireling slaves of the English King George III. And remember, slave was a convenient rhyme for grave. He was, after all, writing a poem. It may be as simple as that. Before the recent ruckus, no one who sang the national anthem thought it sent a racial message. If anything, people believed that the anthem promoted unity as it was intended to do. Besides, as previously noted, hardly any Americans even knew the third stanza existed. During World War II, GIs trying to uncover German infiltrators would ask suspected spies to sing the second or third or fourth verse of the Star Spangled Banner. If they didn't know the words, they were assumed to be genuine Americans. Those who declare the flag and the national anthem to be racist would do well to remember that Martin Luther King Jr. and his supporters carried the American flag during their famous Selma March. When they reached the State House in Montgomery, Alabama, guess what song they sang? That's right, the Star Spangled Banner. I'm James Robbins, columnist for USA Today and author of Erasing America for Prager University. I picked a fine time to become an American. It was a grey, overcast morning in Oakland, California. I was one of 1,094 people of every colour and creed from 85 nations, beginning with Afghanistan and ending with Yemen. We had gathered, anxiously clutching the requisite documents, outside the rather antique Paramount Cinema. I wasn't the only new citizen of European origin, but we were a distinct minority. Rather to my surprise, the Chinese were the most numerous group, accounting for close to a fifth of the new Americans. How many Americans became Chinese citizens that week? Next were the Mexicans, more than 150 of them, then the Filipinos, closely followed by the Indians. Yet it was the sheer range of countries represented that was most marvellous. The young man to my right, immaculately dressed in white, was from Eritrea. He had studied computer science in Wales and had initially come to California to work for NASA. I approach any encounter with US bureaucracy weighed down by dread. So, I wondered, would this be like the Department of Motor Vehicles famed for its Soviet-style antagonism to the public? Or would it be more like the implacable, pitiless Internal Revenue Service? In fact, the officials of the US Citizenship and Immigration Services could hardly have been more affable. The Master of Ceremonies was a genial, balding, bespectacled chap who won his audience over with a virtuoso display of multilingualism, chatting to us in what sounded like pretty fluent Spanish, Chinese, French, Hindi, and Tagalog. Yet this was very far from a multicultural occasion. Quite the reverse. To get us in the mood for our impending Americanization, a choir sang a patriotic medley, including a rather baroque setting of the preamble to the Constitution, Yankee Doodle, and Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land. Well, that did it. The way that song conjures up vast American landscapes, from the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters, always gets me by the throat, because, glimpsed in films, such vistas were what first drew me to the United States. Then came the information about our rights and obligations, specifically our right to vote, our option to obtain a passport, and our inextricable link to the social security system. Nothing, rather disappointingly, about the right to bear arms, and not a word about the spiralling federal debt we were all now on the hook for. The ceremony then became more stirring, a Faces of America video had a distinctly martial soundtrack. We raised our right hands to swear the oath of allegiance, 
absolutely renouncing all allegiance to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty, and swearing to bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law. Then we placed our right hands on our hearts to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the national flag and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's heady stuff, even in Oakland on a Thursday morning. And then there he was, the President of the United States himself, much larger than life on the big screen. This country is now your country, Donald Trump told us rather sternly. Our history is now your history, and our traditions are now your traditions. And that wasn't all. You now share the obligation to teach our values to others, to help newcomers assimilate to our way of life. Compare and contrast with the Barack Obama version. Together, we are a nation united not by any one culture or ethnicity or ideology. The grand finale was God Bless the USA, a country music anthem by Lee Greenwood made famous following the 9-11 terror attacks on New York and Washington. It too was a call to arms. And I'm proud to be an American, but at least I know I'm free, and I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me. More than half a century of being British has made it hard for me not to cringe just a little at this kind of thing. But this hokum is now my hokum, and this president is now my president, until such time as we the people vote in another one. Yes, I picked a fine time to become an American, because it's always a fine time. I'm Neil Ferguson, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University. When John Adams and Benjamin Franklin read Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence, they undoubtedly recognized two things, Jefferson's peerless prose and the political wisdom of the 17th century English thinker, John Locke. We still admire Jefferson's skill as a writer, but we have lost an appreciation for Jefferson's philosophical mentor. John Locke was born in 1632 in a small village in Somerset, England. He studied at Oxford to be a physician, but achieved fame as a political theorist. In 1690, he authored one of the most famous political tracts in history, Two Treatises of Government. England had just gone through a period of great political turmoil, the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688, in which the Catholic King, James II, was overthrown and replaced by a Protestant one, William of Orange. The purpose of that revolution, which Locke supported, was not merely to substitute one king for another, but to move power away from the monarch and place it in the hands of the people and their elected representatives. The laws and liberties of this kingdom, in Locke's view, belonged to its citizens. This was, of course, how the American rebels saw their relationship with England. The Americans had no say in laws that the English crown and parliament were forcing on them. And, to put it mildly, they didn't like it. No taxation without representation was a classic expression of their displeasure. But how to frame the argument so that the whole world would understand it? Jefferson looked to Locke for inspiration and guidance. And using Locke helped in another way. How better, Jefferson calculated, to justify an American revolution than to use the arguments that were once used to justify an English one? So, what were those arguments? Locke posited three. First, all men are created equal. Second, certain basic rights exist independent of government. Third, government exists to protect those rights. Let's take them in turn. Number one, all men are created equal. Locke starts this argument at a very basic level, namely, that human beings were created equal by God. We're all part of the same species, we're all capable of doing human things. In that sense, we are equal, not in qualities or outcome, but in rights. As John Locke wrote, creatures of the same species, born to all the same advantages of nature and the use of the same faculties, should also be equal without subordination or subjection. In this way, a king is in no way superior to a commoner, such that he might violate the commoner's rights. The king is a human being. The commoner is a human being. Each can reason. Therefore, one is equal to the other. We take this for granted now, but in 1690, it was a radical notion. Number two, certain basic rights exist independent of government. Locke believed that it was man's natural state to be free. Therefore, freedom pre-exists government. That is, freedom came first, government came later. 
One hears this thinking expressed in Jefferson's famous phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Here's how Locke put it. The natural state of man is to be free from any superior power on earth and not to be under the will or legislative authority of a government. As rational human beings, Locke contended, we have the liberty, whether king or commoner, to think and act as we wish so long as we harm no one else. Number three, government exists to protect those rights. For Locke, the purpose of government was to protect the individual's freedom and to protect the property, the land and material goods he lawfully acquired. The last thing Locke wanted was to give the government the power to take away that liberty or undermine those property rights. If government couldn't provide those protections or if it abused its power, it didn't deserve to exist. The end of law, he wrote, is not to abolish or restrain freedom, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. Boiled down into a revolutionary slogan, we might summarize Locke's three-pronged philosophy this way. Don't tread on me. Can't get much more American than that. But today, Locke's ideas are under full-fledged assault. There are many Americans who believe that human beings are not created equal, that we should treat people differently based on their group identity. There are many Americans who believe that rights do not pre-exist government, that government is both our master and protector, granting and withdrawing privileges as it sees fit. And there are many Americans who believe that government should have almost unlimited power. Everything that Locke rejected, these Americans rushed to embrace. Their preference for paternalistic government is not what Locke envisioned or what Jefferson describes in the Declaration of Independence. We need to reintroduce John Locke and his ideas to a nation that has become increasingly blind to fundamental elements of its own history and character. Because if we lose Locke, we lose America. I'm Ben Shapiro for Prager University. This video was made possible through a generous donation from William and Sharon Hupp. The birthday of a new world is at hand. That was what Thomas Paine, the fiery pamphleteer, wrote in 1776, as 13 of Great Britain's North American colonies rose in revolt against British rule and declared themselves a newly independent nation. The American Revolution was something the world had never seen, politically, economically, and diplomatically. Let's look at all three. First, the politics. Revolutions themselves were not new, of course. Britain put itself through not one but two revolutions in the 17th century. Other countries in Europe endured similar upheavals. These rebellions shared one of two goals — replace the current monarch with another one, or extort new protections and privileges from the existing regime. In stark contrast, the Americans did not propose merely overthrowing a monarchy. They proposed ending the very idea of monarchy as a worthwhile form of government. In America, the citizen, not the government or the king, would hold the keys to power. With this overturning of the old way of doing things, the rebels made the political systems of Europe look as antiquated and irrational as fully as Newton's laws had made medieval physics look antiquated and irrational. As it was with politics, so it was with economics. Tearing up the old order meant more than just refusing to take political orders from kings, dukes, and princes. It meant taking no economic orders from them either. In a society of free and equal citizens, Americans would follow their own economic initiative. They would be as free economically as they were politically. This small government model meant the state was to interfere as little as possible in the citizen's life. Americans founded the only country ever to be based on the principle of restraining the government. And that unleashed such dynamic economic growth, it took America from a fledgling state to a world power in just 50 years. A child born in 1776, could live to see canal systems link waterways from New York to New Orleans, see the electrical telegraph leap across unheard of distances in communications, and the steamboat and railroad move passengers and freight at fractions of the cost imposed by horse and wagon. The sheer novelty of the revolution's first two legs, the political and the economic, 
was so great that many Americans, such as Yale President Timothy Dwight, expressed a desire not merely to remake the North American continent, but the rest of the world as well. America, Dwight wrote in a popular poem of the time, was destined to hush the tumult of war and give peace to the world. But the founders rejected this view. The United States was to be a republic, not an empire, a beacon, not a kingdom. Far from any desire to share America's redemptive culture, the Founders' tendency was to regard the rest of the world as a potential threat, eager to strangle the American experiment, either by the reimposition of empire or by association with more unstable attempts at revolution, as in France. The American position regarding foreign interventions was articulated by then-Secretary of State John Quincy Adams in 1821. Wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been unfurled, there will America's heart, her benedictions, and her prayers be. But she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Of course, the United States has not always lived by this attitude. America has allowed itself to be pulled into foreign adventures of which the founders would have disapproved. Nor has the United States always lived up to its best ideals. It has, at various times, seen unfettered commerce turn into monopoly and corruption. And we've had to deal with the terrible shame of slavery and its long aftermath. Human beings are imperfect, and therefore any form of government they create will be too. But the wonder of America, from its founding to this day, is not that it has stumbled. The wonder is that Americans have stumbled as infrequently as they have, and managed to make and keep America the strongest and freest country in the world. That birthday, Thomas Paine proclaimed, is still very much worth celebrating. If it isn't celebrated, it will be lost. And that would be a tragedy for America and for the world. I'm Alan Gelzo for Prager University. This video was made possible by a generous donation from the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation. Does an American citizen have a constitutional right to own a gun? Here's what the Second Amendment says. A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. Now, it once seemed to me like that language only protected state militias and not individuals. Indeed, this is the view held by the four dissenting Supreme Court justices in the 2008 case of District of Columbia versus Heller, a landmark case dealing with gun ownership. But the more research I did, the more I came to realize that my initial view was mistaken and that the founders were in fact securing an individual right. The five justices who voted to affirm the right to own a gun in DC versus Heller had indeed made the correct decision. Let's look at the amendment one more time. A well-regulated militia, being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. We first need to focus on the phrase, the right of the people. Note that the people are the only ones whose right is secured here, not the militia or a state government. This phrase, the right of the people, comes up a few times in the Constitution. For example, the First Amendment refers to the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government. And the Fourth Amendment secures the right of the people to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. Why then, if the authors of the Constitution felt so strongly about the right of the people to own guns, did they include language about a well-regulated militia? These opening words of the amendment might be called a justification clause. Such clauses are used to help explain why a right is being secured but it's the operative clause that explains what right is being secured. In this case, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And what was the word militia understood to mean at the time? Well, the Militia Act of 1792 defined militia to mean all white males 18 to 45. Today, of course, militia would include women and people of all races, but it was clearly not a reference to a small National Guard type group. And what about the part of the amendment that says a militia is necessary to the security of a free state? 
What the opponents of personal gun ownership ask, does a personal right of gun ownership have to do with that? Again, historical context is key. In the 1790s, the phrase free state wasn't used to mean an individual state like New York or Rhode Island. Rather, it meant what we'd call today a free country, a nation free of despotism. A free state is what the framers wanted America to be. They saw an armed citizenry as in part a hedge against tyranny. Citizens who own weapons can protect themselves, prevent tyrants from seizing power, and protect the nation from foreign enemies. This does not mean, though, that this right is unlimited. Free speech, for example, has long been subject to some narrow and reasonable regulations. But severe restrictions on owning a gun, like severe restrictions on free speech, would violate the Second Amendment as the founders understood it. Maybe you think this understanding of the Second Amendment is outdated today, that the Constitution needs to change as public attitudes change. The founders included a provision for doing just that. If the public attitude really has changed, the Constitution can be amended to reflect that change. But ironically, even if we focus on current public attitudes, the case for individual gun ownership is as strong as ever. Polls consistently show that over two-thirds of Americans believe that the Second Amendment secures the right of citizens to own a gun. And Congress and state governments have repeatedly reaffirmed this view, including in recent decades. So, does the Second Amendment secure an individual right to bear arms? It did when it was written, it has throughout American history, and it does today. I'm Eugene Volokh, professor of law at UCLA for Prager University. Freedom of speech, the ability to express yourself, it's a cherished idea, as well it should be. Most of us who live in liberal Western democracies think of it as a basic human right. People have fought and died for it. But now we may be in danger of losing it. The threat is not coming from without, from external enemies, but from within. A generation is being raised not to believe in freedom of speech, but rather that they should have freedom from speech, from speech they dislike. This is a threat to both pluralism and democracy itself. We see this in Europe, where sensitivity-based censorship attempts to ban anything deemed hateful or even just hurtful, and to ban criticism of religion, especially Islam. But the United States, despite its strong constitutional protections in the Bill of Rights, is far from immune from the rising trend of suppression of speech, or what is sometimes called political correctness. This is especially true at America's colleges and universities, the place where our future leaders are educated and where you'd expect speech to be the most free. Highly restrictive speech codes are now the norm on campus, not the exception. According to a study by my organization, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, 54% of public universities and 59% of private universities impose politically correct speech codes on their students. And thanks to recent Department of Education guidelines, 100% of colleges may adopt speech codes in the coming years. How bad is it? At a public campus in California on Constitution Day in 2013, a student who also happens to be a decorated military veteran was told he could not hand out copies of the Constitution to his fellow students. The objection from the university was not ideological. It was out-of-control bureaucracy imposing limits on speech. That same day, another college student in that same state was told he could not protest NSA surveillance outside of a tiny free speech zone, an area that comprised only 1.37% of the campus. Months later, college students in Hawaii were told both they could not hand out the Constitution to their fellow students and that they could not protest NSA policies outside the school's free speech zone. Fire took these colleges to court, but the fact that we had to shows you how bad it has become. Recently, students and sympathetic faculty have joined forces to exclude campus speakers whose opinions they dislike. At FIRE, we call this disinvitation season, although the season lasts all year round. Since 2009, there has been a major uptick in the push by students and faculty to get speakers they dislike disinvited. These speakers have included former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, 
the Somali-born feminist and critic of Islam, Ayan Hirsi Ali, and the director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde. And that's only the obvious part of the disinvitation problem. Few conservative speakers are invited to speak at colleges lest they have to be disinvited later. The newest threat to speech comes from so-called trigger warnings, alerts that warn students that they are about to read or hear something that triggers a negative emotional response. A 2014 New York Times article cited the example of a Rutgers student requesting trigger warnings for the classic American novel The Great Gatsby because it, quote, possesses a variety of scenes that reference abusive misogynistic violence, unquote. Recently, Oberlin College attempted to institute a policy that heavily encouraged the faculty to avoid difficult topics and to employ trigger warnings as a means of making classrooms safer. Safety has been watered down to essentially mean the right to always feel comfortable. New demands for trigger warnings are popping up on campuses across the country. Add in popular academic theories that encourage students to scrutinize speech for microaggressions, any statement that might be construed as racially insensitive, classist, sexist, or otherwise un-PC, and it's clear that campuses are teaching students to police what they say. This is precisely the opposite of what is needed. Our society needs candor, and it needs freedom of speech, not freedom from speech. Intellectual comfort is not a right, nor should it ever be. Not if we want freedom of speech, let's just call it freedom, to survive. I'm Greg Lukianoff, President of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education for Prager University. How did the framers of the Constitution of the United States seek to preserve liberty and prevent tyranny? Pretty basic question. Here's the answer I usually get from my students. Well, professor, to protect the individual and minorities against the tyranny of the majority, they added the Bill of Rights, and they gave the power to enforce those rights to the Supreme Court. Are my students correct? The editorial boards of the New York Times or the Washington Post and many members of the U.S. Congress would say yes. Unfortunately, the answer is wrong. I say unfortunately because it reflects a common misunderstanding of the Constitution, and that misunderstanding has led to a serious erosion of our freedom. Let me explain. Both the Bill of Rights and judicial review, the idea that the courts can decide if a law is constitutional or not, were hotly debated items when the Constitution was being drafted in 1789. The Federalists, the group led by Alexander Hamilton that wanted a national constitution, opposed including a Bill of Rights. They feared it would actually undermine what the Federalists regarded as the main protections against tyranny in the document, the limited nature of the national government itself. The Constitution did not envision a national government of general jurisdiction, meaning a government that could do whatever it wanted, but rather a government of enumerated and delegated powers, a government that had authority over only specific areas of American life. All other powers were to be beyond the scope of the national government and reserved to the states or to the American people themselves. That's why when political necessity forced the Federalists to yield to demands for a Bill of Rights, they took care to add two important amendments, the Ninth and Tenth. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. These amendments reinforce the idea that the national government couldn't just assume powers it had not been specifically granted by the Constitution. Unfortunately, these amendments have not stymied the expansion of the national authority. The power grab the Federalists feared, the national government taking more and more control over more and more areas of American life, took place. Not immediately, but over time, and especially beginning in the second half of the 20th century. That same time frame has seen a similar concentration of power in the judiciary, especially in the Supreme Court, so that now 
Most Americans think of the Supreme Court as the ultimate arbiter of almost every social and political dispute. The founders never envisioned the court in this role. How has the court fared in playing it? Well, there have been moments of glory, to be sure, such as in the racial desegregation case of Brown against the Board of Education in the 1950s. But it has also handed down decision after decision from Dred Scott against Sanford in the 1850s, which facilitated the expansion of slavery, to Roe against Wade in the 1970s, which legalized abortion throughout the United States, in which the justices have plainly overstepped the bounds of their authority by creating law from the bench, thereby further expanding their own power and that of the national government. Moreover, the Supreme Court has done little to stop the executive and legislative branches of the national government from unconstitutionally overreaching. Recently, the court found a way, by a bare majority, to uphold an obvious case of constitutional overreach by the national government, the imposition of a law or individual mandate, as it is known, requiring every citizen to purchase health insurance coverage as part of President Obama's signature Affordable Care Act. The government defended this mandate as a legitimate exercise of its expressly delegated power to regulate commerce among the states. The trouble is that the mandate does not regulate commerce at all. Rather, it forces people into commerce on pain of a financial penalty. But why did the issue get to the courts at all? Congress and the president should have recognized and honored the fact that the Constitution simply does not empower the national government to impose a mandate on the people to purchase products, whether health insurance or anything else. We've drifted a long way from the original vision of the founders. The further we've drifted, the more powerful the national government has grown and the less free Americans have become. Freedom can be taken away, but it can also be given away out of sheer ignorance. If we Americans, we the people, want to get some of that freedom back, we need to read America's founding documents. All the freedom we ever wanted is there. I'm Robert George, professor of jurisprudence at Princeton University for Prager University. One of the most important differences between the left and the right is how each regards the role and the size of the government. The left believes that the state should be the most powerful force in society. Among many other things, the government should be in control of educating every child, should provide all health care, and should regulate often to the minutest detail how businesses conduct their business. In Germany, for instance, the government legislates the time of day stores have to close. In short, there should ideally be no power that competes with government. Not parents, not businesses, not private schools, not religious institutions, not even the individual human conscience. Conservatives, on the other hand, believe the government's role in society should be limited to absolute necessities such as national defense, and to being the resource of last resort to help citizens who cannot be helped by family, by community, or by religious and secular charities. Conservatives understand that as governments grow in size and power, the following will inevitably happen. One, there will be ever-increasing amounts of corruption. Power and money breed corruption. People in government will sell government influence for personal and political gain, and people outside government will seek to buy influence and favors. In Africa and Latin America, government corruption has been the single biggest factor holding nations back from progressing. Two, individual liberty will decline. With a few exceptions, such as an unrestricted right to abortion, individual liberty is less important to the left than to the right. This is neither an opinion nor a criticism. It is simple logic. The more control the government has over people's lives, the less liberty people have. Three, countries with ever-expanding governments will either reduce the size of their government or eventually collapse economically. Every welfare state ultimately becomes a Ponzi scheme, 
relying on new payers to pay previous payers. And when it runs out of the new payers, the scheme collapses. All the welfare states of the world, including wealthy European countries, are already experiencing this problem to varying degrees. Four, in order to pay for an ever-expanding government, taxes are constantly increased. But at a given level of taxation, the society's wealth producers will either stop working, work less, hire fewer people, or move their business out of the state or out of the country. Five, big government produces big deficits and ever-increasing and ultimately unsustainable debt. This too is only logical. The more money the state hands out, the more money people will demand from the state. No recipient of free money has ever said, thank you, I have enough. Unless big governments get smaller, they will all eventually collapse under their own weight with terrible consequences socially as well as economically. Six, the bigger the government, the greater the opportunities for doing great evil. The 20th century was the most murderous century in recorded history. And who did all this killing? Big governments. Evil individuals without power can do only so much harm. But when evil individuals take control of a big government, the amount of harm they can do is essentially unlimited. The right fears big government. The left fears big business. But Coca-Cola can't break into your house or confiscate your wealth. Only big government can do that. As irresponsible as any big business has ever been, it is only big government that can build concentration camps and commit genocide. Seven, big government eats away at the moral character of a nation. People no longer take care of other people. After all, they know the government will do that. That's why Americans give far more of their money and volunteer far more of their time to charity than do Europeans at the same economic level. Without the belief in an ever-expanding government, there is no left. Without a belief in limited government, there is no right. I'm Dennis Prager. The next time you hear a politician call for common sense gun control, listen for the details. You are likely to be treated to a torrent of platitudes about assault weapons, gun show sales, and other half measures. These sorts of proposals are rooted in a theory of gun control that has been around since the 1960s. The basic idea is that fewer guns equal less gun crime. But for this theory to have even a chance of working, drastic reductions in the supply of guns will be necessary. Everything else amounts to security theater. The late Senator Howard Metzenbaum, a strong gun control advocate, explained it this way. If you don't ban all guns, you might as well ban none of them. But few, if any, politicians who call for common sense gun control have the courage to propose this. Even putting aside the issue of the Second Amendment to the Constitution, which affirms the right to keep and bear arms, a gun ban has no broad popular support. Never mind the conservative states. Handgun ban referendums failed by large margins in two of our most liberal states, Massachusetts in 1976 and California in 1982. No serious attempts have been made since then. Recently, Australia's gun control efforts have gained new prominence as a possible model for the United States to follow. Let's take a closer look at Australia. In 1996, after a lunatic used a semi-automatic rifle to murder 34 people in Tasmania, the Australian government banned all semi-automatic rifles and repeating shotguns. Owners of roughly 700,000 registered firearms, about a quarter of the country's three million total guns, were required to turn them in for destruction. The government called this a buyback, but in fact, no one had a choice. As my research shows, this model will not work in the United States for the simple reason that the U.S. has roughly 325 million guns. This is orders of magnitude more than any other country. Even if the Australian plan were tried in the U.S. and worked perfection, we'd still be left with over 200 million guns, including handguns, which account for nearly 80% of gun crime. But gun confiscation has never worked to perfection and sometimes threatens to make things worse. 
The 2007 International Small Arms Survey studied 72 countries that attempted to enforce gun confiscation or registration on their citizens. They found massive defiance of these laws, with only about a third of gun owners complying. If Americans defy gun bans at just the average rate that has occurred internationally, then we should expect tens of millions of guns to flood into the black market. Not surprisingly, politicians advocating for gun control prefer to avoid the thorny issues that confiscation raises. Instead, they seek to have it both ways. They pursue the votes of gun owners by paying lip service to the Second Amendment and offering assurances that they only want to ban the bad guns, like rifles with pistol grips. And at the same time, they pander to their core constituents with broad gun ban rhetoric and supply control proposals that will have a marginal effect at best. And when these meager efforts fail to pass or to work, blame the gun lobby. So, to the glib critics of America's gun culture, we should make this demand. If supply controls are the answer, describe precisely the full program of supply-side policies you propose to stop gun crimes that we all abhor. And then tell us how those policies will also allow lawful gun owners to keep and protect themselves with firearms. If you cannot square these two things, then you must convince Americans that they are better off under policies that would disarm good people in a fruitless attempt to keep bad men from getting guns. I'm Nicholas Johnson, professor of law at Fordham University for Prager University. What kind of future do we have if we destroy our past? Has anyone who has pulled down a statue of Churchill, Lincoln, or Columbus thought to ask themselves this question? I doubt it. The presumption that we can stand in perfect judgment over the lives of historical figures is not merely foolish and unfair, it's dangerous. Consider what the statue destroyers are in effect saying. They are saying that people in history should have known what we know. That's tantamount to saying they should have known the future. This is, of course, absurd. Yet more and more people believe it. Why? Simple. It's what they're taught. It is the fruit of an education system that long ago prioritised empathy over facts, that believes the ultimate point of history is not to learn lessons from it, but to judge it from the preordained left-wing conclusions about such ill-defined concepts as social justice, equity and tolerance. Apart from breeding ignorance, this kind of education invites the student, the child really, to be judge, jury and executioner over issues that they, and increasingly their teachers, know little or nothing about. Because no one has bothered to teach them the nuance, complexity and context that is history. It also breeds arrogance. I know things these people did not know, therefore I am better than they were, they have nothing to teach me, in fact I must teach them, and down comes the statue. A new, better history must take the place of the old one. In America, this impulse has culminated in the 1619 Project, an initiative started by the New York Times and now in schools everywhere, which attempts to make the arrival of the first African slaves into the American colonies the foundational date of the American Republic. 1776, the American Revolution? In the new history, that was just about protecting the founders' slave interests. These men, some of the most remarkable humans to have lived at any time, are to be understood simply by their attitude towards this one issue. The 1619 Project seeks to portray America, the freest, most prosperous nation in world history, as exceptional only in one respect, insofar as being exceptionally bad. This is a purposefully destructive view of history. It is one intended to pull down rather than to build up. A healthy, humane and in the truest sense liberal mind does not view history as a mere playpen for our moral judgment. It recognises that people in the past acted on the information they had just as we do today. Sure, it would have been nice if the founders of America had abolished slavery in its constitution. Some, in fact, tried very hard to do so. But had they been unwilling to compromise, there would be no constitution and no United States. All the sacrifices of the revolution would have been lost, so a compromise balancing the interests of the northern states and the southern states was reached. It would have been nice if the Japanese had surrendered before atom bombs were dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but they didn't. 
President Truman had to make his decision based on the information he had at the time, that an Allied invasion of the Japanese home island would cost at least a million lives, both American and Japanese. Of course, the woke mind abhors these subtleties. It knows that it is right, and that everybody before our current age, year zero, should have known better. Anyway, they were all bigots. Why should we give them any benefit of the doubt, let alone admire them or learn from them? Well, maybe because, like everyone else, the great figures of the past did the best they could under the circumstances in which they found themselves. That their efforts largely succeeded is why we are here. When someone tried to give Sir Isaac Newton credit for his world-changing discoveries in physics, the great man demurred. He said he was only able to achieve what he did by standing on the shoulders of the giants who went before him. Today's left rejects Newton's humility. It doesn't believe that we stand on anyone's shoulders. It imagines that if we could only liberate ourselves from the dusty, misguided and misinformed ideas of the past, then we might see further, fly still higher. This view is wrong. Divorced from our past, we would be utterly lost. We would not rise, but plummet. We would be forced to start again with far less insight and with far poorer examples as our guides. Ironically, thanks to the statue destroyers, the great figures of the past have never looked greater. I'm Douglas Murray, author of The Madness of Crowds, for Prager University. The federal government has become a lumbering giant. With each passing year, it gets bigger and scarier. In 1965, Washington was $761 billion big. In 2016, it was three and a half trillion, five times the size. If the government spent only the money it collected in taxes, that would be one thing. But it always spends more, which is why we're $20 trillion in debt. That's 13 zeros, count them, 13. But the crazy spending isn't even the worst of it. Washington is involved in every part of our lives. Think about anything you do, from driving your car to buying your groceries to mowing your lawn. Whatever it is, your education, your job, your health, the government has its hands on your shoulder, if not on your throat. As a congressman and senator for 14 years, I know this only too well. So how do we cut this giant down to size? Is it even possible? Yes. And the amazing thing is the answer is right in front of us. The Founding Fathers in their wisdom foresaw the situation we find ourselves in today. They wrote into the Constitution a way to repair Washington. Not from the inside, because that will never happen, but from the outside, where it might. It's right there in Article 5. Most people are familiar with the first part. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution. All 27 amendments we have now started this way. Congress proposed them, and at least three-quarters of the states ratified them. But is this the only way to amend the Constitution? Well, let's read the next clause. It says that Congress, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. Did you catch that? Congress must call a convention to amend the Constitution if two-thirds of the states, that's 34 states, demand it. The time has come to demand it. The time has come to propose amendments that will restore meaningful limits on federal power and authority. The time has come for a convention of states. Here's how it would work. Once the 34 states call a convention, all 50 states send a delegate to represent their interest. For any constitutional amendments proposed, each state gets one vote. And an amendment only passes out of the convention and to the states for ratification if a majority of the state's delegates vote in the affirmative. In this scenario, Congress has no say. It is completely in the hands of the states, which means it's a whole lot closer to the hands of the people. We've never once amended the Constitution this way, but that doesn't mean we can't. 
But you might ask, doesn't this open the door to rewriting the entire Constitution? Antonin Scalia, the late Supreme Court Justice, acknowledged this risk, but regarded it as a minimal and reasonable one. Why? Because to be ratified, a proposed amendment would need the approval of 38 states. That's a high bar. 38 states would never agree to something radical like abolishing freedom of speech. The founders, Scalia said, knew the Congress would be unwilling to give attention to many issues the people are concerned with, particularly those involving restrictions on the federal government's own power. So they provided the Convention of States as a remedy. This should not be a partisan, left-right, Democrat-Republican issue. This should be a who-controls-your-life issue. You or the government. Today, politicians can turn your life upside down on a whim. Kind of like King George in 1775. Being at the mercy of distant, disconnected rulers was why the American Revolution was fought in the first place. But we don't need a revolution. We have Article 5. So what amendments might a convention of states propose to limit Washington's power? Term limits, for one. And no one should be in Congress for 20 or 30 years. The only people who disagree have been in Congress for 20 or 30 years. And how about a limit on taxes, spending, and borrowing? Since you began this video, the national debt has gone up $8.4 million. Here's one more idea. A constitutional amendment that Congress can't exempt itself from the laws it passes. Something it's done dozens of times from insider trading to Obamacare. Now, I don't believe a convention of states will solve all of America's problems, but the founders put it in the Constitution for a reason. They knew a time would come when Washington would become so big and so intrusive that only we, the people, could cut it down to size. That time is now. I'm Jim DeMint for Prager University.